بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله um, our previous lesson last Sunday was cancelled because I was traveling however that doesn't mean we don't benefit and like I mentioned in the previous lesson that we have an exam in the next lesson so that will still stay, uh, take place so this Sunday the 14th of August there is still an exam and uh, the exam will be on everything that we have taken just today's lesson inshallah and today's lesson will be short, um, I'll try to make it as short as possible, it won't be too long. I did say um, that uh, the questions will be just written out questions, but I might, add, I might change it for a little bit. I might add a few uh, multiple choice questions here and there, but the majority, the main questions will be, you know, just an answer where you have to write your own, your own uh, the question where you have to write your own um, answer. We've only got a bit left. We've got two pages left, so let's finish off these two pages, inshallah. And I'm not going to repeat as much because it's recorded. So anyone who needs it to be repeated, you can just pause and go back and rewrite it like that, inshallah. So we have uh, on page uh, 20, general points regarding hadith transmission according to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. So after we've talked about the Sahaba and their scrolls and so on, so just some general points regarding how they would transmit hadith. The first point is that the companions they did not narrate for the sake of narration itself but rather they did it due to a necessity due to a necessity of propagating the knowledge due to them fearing that they will make mistakes when they narrate so they didn't just go up and start narrating just like that every time they learn something go and narrate it like that right and that's a lesson for us we shouldn't do that I should, as well we shouldn't hasten that just because we learned something one small thing that this scholar said that we just hasten to uh, narrate it the other sahaba radiallahu anhu like that because it takes time for a person to understand what it is uh, what, and what it, what it truly means and so on but the sahaba radiallahu anhu they only spoke if it was a necessity and they feared making uh, mistakes for example in Sahih Bukhari in Sahih Bukhari 107 107 Abdullah ibn Zubair, he said to his father, I do not hear you, I do not hear from you any ahadith of the Prophet as I hear such and such a companion narrating. Meaning, I know you know a lot, but you don't narrate it a lot. So, as Zubair he replied, I was with the Prophet وسلم, and I heard him say, Man Whoever lies about me intentionally, then let him take his seat in the hellfire. Whoever lies about me intentionally, let him take a seat in the hellfire. So if you say the Prophet said this, but you've made a mistake, you've said the Prophet said something when he didn't say that. So they fear that, you know, we don't want to make any mistakes and fall under that punishment of taking our seats in the hellfire. You say the Prophet said, Inna mal a'ma la bin niyat. No, the Prophet said, Inna mal a'ma lu bin niyat. That's why Al-Asma'i, rahimahullah, he said, I fear that the one who makes mistakes in the hadith of the Prophet will fall under this hadith. Man kathab alayhi wa ta'amidan, fal yatabawwa maqa'adahu min al nar it's not necessarily a big difference, but it doesn't necessarily, even that example, a'mala, a'malu, doesn't really change the meaning. But it's still a mistake the first time they say it. And obviously, if it did change the meaning, then that's even worse. So they would only narrate when they were certain or something, 100%. The second is that hadith criticism started in the time of Sahaba. Anhu. Hadith criticism started in the time of the Sahaba, anhu. meaning that they would. Uh, Criticize, i.e., they would double check on the narrations and so on. Okay, so and this is where the muhaddithun are taking it from. When they look at the chain of narration, they look at each person who is he, is he trustworthy, did he make a mistake, and uh, so on. And this started in the time of Sahaba, uh, radiallahu anhu. So, I mean, this started in, even Syrian says in uh, the introduction of Sahih Muslim that we never used to ask each other regarding the chain of narration but once the fitna took place i.e. the killing of Uthman we used to say Sammu lana rijalakum mention to us your men if they were from Ahlul Sunnah we would take it and if they were from Ahlul Bid'a then we wouldn't take it and this Ibn Sirin was a tabi'i and this narration might come to a lot of people's minds but even before that even before the killing of Uthman hadith criticism took place I'm going to give you an example of Abu Bakr I'm going to give you an example of Umar so the first people to do it was Abu Bakr and then Umar and then later on, it became a bit more widespread. Because obviously, obviously in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, all trustworthy, there was no fitna. And after the king of Uthman, more fitna took place. That increased later on. 
But the first people to do it were who? Abu Bakr and Umar. So for example, in uh, Abu Dawood 2894, Abu Dawood 2894, and in Tirmidhi 2100, Tirmidhi 2100, and it's authenticated by Ibn Hajar, authenticated by Ibn Hajar. You can read the whole narration, but just to summarize, a grandmother came asking for the inheritance. Like my grandson passes away, how much do I get? He said he didn't know. So uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he asked some of the companions. So Maghira bin Shu'ba, he got up and he said, um, she gets a she gets a sixth, she gets a uh, a sixth. So Abu Bakr said, "Is there anyone with you? Can anyone testify to this?" So this is the said, and Muhammad ibn Maslama, Muhammad ibn Maslama, he got up and he testified, and he testified. So Abu Bakr gave her uh, give us a, a one sixth of the uh, inheritance. This wasn't necessarily that he didn't believe this companion, but he wanted to make sure there's no mistake. He wanted to confirm. Likewise, Umar radiallahu an. In uh, Sahih Muslim 2153, Sahih Muslim 2153, and Sahih Bukhari 6245, and Sahih Al Bukhari uh, 6245. To summarize, again, uh, well, so this time we have Abu Musa al Ashari. He knocked on the door of Umar radiallahu anhu thrice, and he didn't open the door, so he went. So Umar said to him, Why are you going? And he mentioned that I heard before Islam say that if you knock three times and I don't open the door, then just leave. So he said, what's your proof? And he mentioned, uh, he said, have you got anybody else that can testify to this? And then Abu Musa radiallahu anhu went and um, Ubayy bin Ka'ab well Abu Musa he went to a gathering and Abu, Abu uh, bin Ka'ab um, Uh, yeah, so, so Umar said bring the proof So Ubay and Ka'ab said Alright take the youngest person that we have And take him as a proof So Abu Sa'id Al-Khudri radiallahu an He Went with Abu Musa To inform Umar radiallahu an Of what the Prophet Had Had said yeah, So it was So uh, Abu Sa'id went with Abu uh, Musa. The next point is that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum only narrated what the people understood. They only narrated what the people understood. So they wouldn't narrate everything. Everything that they knew, they wouldn't narrate it. Likewise, that's what teachers should do. They should narrate everything they know. Likewise, in my classes, I'm not narrating to you every single thing that I know. A lot of things I've taken out are not mentioned. Why? Because it's not. It won't be understood fully by the student. A student has to take his time and understanding, just like we have GCSE, A levels, university, and uh, and so on. And that's why even the famous hadith of the Prophet where he mentioned the right of Allah upon the slaves, which is to worship him alone. And if they do that, then the right of the slave of Allah is that Allah will enter them into uh, paradise. And Mu'az said to the Prophet should we not inform the people? Afala ubashirunna, should I not give glad, glad tidings to the people? And uh, the Prophet said, "La tubashirun fayatakiru." Do not inform them and give them this glad tidings, because they will become lazy. They will think, "Just la ilaha illallah is enough, and not know anything else." So, out of this wisdom, it is allowed for you to keep some of that knowledge. It's not always correct to say that kitmanu ilm, concealing knowledge, is something wrong. La. At times, when there's more benefit, then then you should. Ali radiyallahu anhu said, "Hadithu nasi bima yarifun aturidu na yukazab Allahu rasuluh." Speak to the people with what they understand and what they can comprehend. Do you want them to disbelieve in Allah and the Messenger? When you speak about issues which is not on their level, and maybe not even on the teacher's level sometimes, that's going to cause more confusion. And then, you know, instead of it being something, instead of being knowledge that you should tell the people, and instead of even being something that you shouldn't tell them, like it's makru and it's best not to, it can sometimes even become haram. It can even become haram because it's going to cause a lot more harm. So this is the third point. The fourth point is that the Sahaba would also write down hadith to one another. They would advise one another and they would write down a hadith to one another and the fifth point is that they would tell their students the tabi'een to also write down hadith they would tell their students from the tabi'een to also write down hadith so this is page number 20 now we move on to the page uh, 21 which we are now going to talk a bit about Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. because he is the main narrator in hadith a lot of people want to attack Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. but let's quickly speak a bit about uh, Abu Hurairah so that we Let's give a small introduction uh, in regards to him so that you can 
so you know a bit about him and you know his biography should be something should be you know separated as a if not a whole lecture at least half a lecture or something but we are just going to uh, summarize so Abu Hudr radiallahu became Muslim in the seventh year after Hijrah in the seventh year after Hijrah he is from and he came when the Muslims were at the Battle of Khaybar and at that time he came to Medina and Prison wasn't there so then he went to Khaybar to meet the Prophet Islam and accepted Islam he was from Alhamdulillah <coughs> he was from the tribe of Addaus that's why uh, and his actual name by the way was Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr there's a lot of khilaf in his name the famous most famous is Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr and then they say Addausi Addausi that's the, that's the tribe that he was from and he was approximately 30 years old when he came he was from the poorest of the Sahaba in fact he was known as from the Ahl Sufa where, uh, Sufa where they were uh, they were the poor companions who would live in the masjid they didn't have family not a job so they would just live in the masjid and right now in Medina just behind the Rawdah you can see an elevated place uh, a little bit elevated that, that's what they say that they used to gather and if you look at the way he spent his time he would only spend his time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam learning with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, eating with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, going with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when he wasn't with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would be revising hadith and he was known as the Hafid of the Sahaba he was known as the Hafid of the Sahaba uh, as he had memorized the most hadith and this is something which is acknowledged by other companions and also ulama that came after him and there are many quotes to prove that point we don't have time to mention all of them um, right now and um, I think I've written a couple Imam al-Shafi'i said Abu Hurairah was the person who preserved the most hadith from those narrating in his time and like Imam al-Zahabi said we do not know of a single mistake he made in in hadith that shows the level of Abu Hurairah in hadith but I'm going to mention two of the narrations that took place as well which kind of show his status the first is hadith in Bukhari hadith number 29 the hadith that you might have heard me mention before that the, he asked the Prophet who is the one who is the most deserving of your intercession on the day of judgment and then the Prophet Sallallahu said that I didn't think that anybody else would ask this question apart from you because of uh, because of me knowing how eager you are from seeking knowledge and then the Prophet answered the question uh, that man qala la ilaha illallah khalisa min qalbi dakhala jannah whoever says la ilaha illallah sincerely from his heart then he will enter into uh, paradise the point being is even the Prophet acknowledged how much he loved seeking knowledge and there's another hadith also in Bukhari 3708 3708 where Abu Hurairah uh, he narrates that the people used to say Abu Hurairah narrates too many narrations in fact I used to keep close to the mes- Allah's Messenger وسلم, and was satisfied with what filled my stomach meaning I, never, I used to stay with Prophet I, I didn't worry about how much I used to eat I ate no uh, Livland bread and dress no decorated striped clothes meaning I just I didn't have any special bread just wherever I had no special clothing and never did a man or a woman serve me and I often used to press my belly against gravel because of hunger and I used to ask a man to recite a Quranic verse to me although I knew it so that he would take me to his home and feed me now, just distract conversation hoping that maybe that person of his goodwill will say okay come you know in my house and the most generous of all the people to the poor was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib he used to take us to his home and offer us what was available therein he would even offer us an empty folder leather container of butter which we would split and lick whatever was in it now, that subhanAllah shows the level you know how much effort Abu Hurairah used to put in accompanying the Prophet and in revising hadith but now we come to an issue you know this question that you have in your worksheet now if he was only with the Prophet for four years so so he accepted Islam in the seventh year right seventh eighth ninth tenth four years right give or take a bit because the Prophet passed away in the beginning of the eleventh let's say approximately four years right how did he narrate the most hadith how did he narrate more than Bukhari a Muslim and that's the question if he was only with the Prophet for four years how did he narrate the most uh, a hadith we're going to give a number of answers insha'Allah we're going to give a number of answers uh, the first answer is the the quality of time he spent with the Prophet 
the quality of time he spent with the Prophet So when he was with the Prophet he was always learning from the Prophet right? And even other companions who had accepted Islam for a longer time, they may not have accompanied the Prophet for as, as much as Abu Huraira did because they had businesses and uh, other commitments. The second is the quality of time that Abu Huraira spent alone. Alone, what was he doing? Just revising a hadith, just revising and revising. What he learned from the Prophet Sallallahu and he was said that he would spend a third of the of his night just revising hadith. The third, and by the way, you know, some of these points can be backed up with the hadith I just mentioned previously as well, and the incidences uh, uh, which took place with Abu Hurairah r.a. The third is Abu Hurairah r.a. passed away a lot later than other companions. So Abu Hurairah passed away in the year 57. Other companions passed away when? Abu, uh, Abu Bakr passed away the uh, 13th. Abu uh, Umar r.a. was it 25, Uthman, oh, sorry, 23. Uthman 35, Ali 40, Abu Huraira 57. So he had uh, a lot longer to live and a lot longer to narrate those ahadith. And not only that, but even during those years, he was a lot free, a lot more free than the other companions because Abu Bakr was busy with, he was being the leader. Then Umar after him, right? They were busy with all these things. Abu Huraira was free, people can come ask him and he could easily narrate. The next is Abu Huraira, he had a very good memory. Uh, and never made a mistake. So he had, you know, he was known for his memory. We mentioned uh, some of the statements of the Salaf and Imam Shafi'i, Imam Zahabi, and even the Sahaba themselves have testified to this. Number five, despite the large amount of narrations, none of the Sahaba uh, doubted him. So there wasn't any doubt. Uh, but if, you know, some of this may be narrated, they might have questioned. But Abu Huraira, they were new class. Abu Huraira has narrated it. Because there's no doubt in that at all. You know the companions, we don't doubt the companions. But Abu Huraira was on such a level, you know, that he could just narrate and nobody, would even cross their mind. The sixth is that it's not a condition to narrate directly from the Prophet So the many hadith he heard directly from the Prophet but many other hadith he heard from other companions later on after the Prophet passed away, he would go to other companions and say, what have you learned from the Prophet and learn and take that from them. And he will accumulate more ahadith um, like that. Number seven is that the Prophet made dua for him. The Prophet made dua for his hifz, for his memory, so that he doesn't forget. And there are many narrations you can add them in uh, to prove that. And uh, the eighth point is that if you look at Abu Hurairah and his narrations, you know, they say that he narrated 5,374. 5,374. If you don't count all of the separate chains of narrations and all the repetitions, okay, then meaning like there's one hadith but it's got a different chain of narration. Instead of counting that as five different hadiths, if you count that as one hadith, the number actually comes down a lot and it comes to about 1500. It comes to about 1500. So that, you know, four years, four times 365 is what? It's about 1500. Right? Maybe just a bit less. So even just during the last of Islam, it's very doable. It means that all you have to do is memorize one hadith a day. Just memorize one hadith a day. And that is a lesson for us as well, that knowledge doesn't come all at once. Whoever tries to memorize uh, jumla, Whoever tries to take hadith all at once, it will leave him all at once. And Imam Zuhri said, uh, that was also Imam Zuhri's statement, but another statement he says, that we sought this knowledge, we gained this knowledge how? Jama'ana has the ilm, how we gather all this knowledge? Bil hadith or hadithain, with one hadith or two, or mas'ala or mas'alatain, one issue or just two issues, that's it. We don't need to have a lot of information at once. Rather, it's about a little bit and being uh, steadfast and, uh, being, and, and continuing with, uh, with that. So, uh, that was ha that's how many have I mentioned? The quality of time. That that's eight, right? And we've got nine. Right? That, that's, is there one point missing? The class eight, eight inshallah.
So these are eight reasons to show why Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu how he's able to narrate the most hadith. The last point that we finish off uh, is regarding who are the Sahaba that narrated the most hadith. Who are the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that narrated the most hadith? I'll quickly mention their numbers. The first is Abu Hurairah, who um, narrated five thousand three hundred and seventy-four. Five thousand three hundred and seventy-four. By the way, I've taken this from uh, Ahmed Shakir's footnotes on uh, his tahqiq of Alfiya to Siyuti. So he says five thousand three hundred seventy-four. Then after him was Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, who had 2,630, 2,630. Then Anas ibn Malik, Anas ibn Malik, who had 2,286, 2,286. Then Aisha radiallahu anha, who had 2,210, 2,210. Then Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, who had 1,660, 1,660. And then after him was Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiallahu anhu, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who narrated 1170, 1170, 1170. Then Jabir ibn Abdullah, Jabir ibn Abdullah, who had 1540, 1540. Yeah, I think split, uh, swapped Abu Sa'id and Jabir, uh, them two around. So is, Abu, is Jabir radiallahu anhu, then Abu Sa'id al-Khudri? Jabir had 15. 40 and Abu Sa'id had 1170 so these seven are known as the seven who narrated the most hadith seven who narrated the most hadith and then we have uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Abdullah ibn Mas'ud uh, by the way these seven are no, known as those who narrated the most because they have over a thousand I want to mention two more who also have narrated a lot but sometimes they're not included in those who have narrated the most because they have less than a thousand but they still narrated a lot number eight we have Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who narrated 848, 848. And lastly, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, who narrated 700. Who narrated uh, 700. And with that, we've concluded the era of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu. Make sure you guys revise the era of the Sahaba and also the introduction that we took, including the introductory points of generally, you know, that I talked about the virtue of seeking knowledge and so on. Make sure you revise all of that. I'll give you an exam uh, on that, inshallah. And I remember your homework was on the four Ibadah, the four Abdullahs. I'm not going to add that in the exam, but I'll ask you about it in our following lesson, inshallah. So this Sunday, the 14th, will just be an exam uh, in the masjid. Um, in the masjid, inshallah, after Maghrib, as normal. Um, any students who are following online and would like to take the exam, contact us, inshallah. Maybe we can send you... Uh, an online version of the exam. Bless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his beneficial knowledge. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ilaha illa, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.